college football week 10. Yeah, baby. College football week 10. It is college football week 10, Ty. Without a single doubt, it's college football week 10. College football week 10. Yes. I practiced that in the mirror before hitting record today, Dan. Yeah. The rain in Spain. It is officially November here in the Verballerhood. College football week 10 got here fast. Wait, November? November what? November. Well, where's the sound, Ty? I don't have it at me. You don't have the sound? Ty. No. Well, then, okay, you tell me. What Vember is this? It is November. No! Vember. No! Vember. <laughs> I'm awful. I'm apologizing right now. I have a written statement of apology. Continue. I'm excited to be here with you, Dan Rubenstein, on College Football Week 10. How are you, my friend? I'm very good, Ty. And week 10, I've always said, is my favorite week of the season, excluding week one. There is something about returning to college football in week one, but week 10 is as you know the leaves change, as there's a crisp in the air. And I personally don't love, and I know we're going to do it momentarily here, but I don't love looking at the sport through the lens of the postseason. I enjoy the sport for what it is. And week 10 is that magical moment where we're rounding into form. It's our home stretch that I want to savor every last morsel of. So I celebrate Week 10 in ways that uh, I don't other weeks. Continue, Ty. I'm very excited to be here with you today. We've got a bunch of big games to get through. Of course, we'll start with our big dogs, the four big games this week that we wanted to highlight in stunning detail. (laughs) We've also got our normal segment now where we build out the quads in each window of games to help you help guide you through all the action. We've got some fantasy things that, of course, are going to intersperse throughout our conversation. We've got my red hot picks. Is that true? Sort of, which we're going to do at the end. Ty versus the world and all sorts of fun in between. But before we go any further, Dan, Mm. we've got college football playoff rankings. The first batch of them are out. They are completely meaningless, but nonetheless, still somewhat newsworthy. Number one, the Ohio State Buckeyes. Number two, the Georgia Bulldogs. Number three, the Michigan Wolverines. Number four, the Florida State Seminoles. Five through 10, Washington Huskies, Oregon Ducks, Texas Longhorns, Alabama Crimson Tide, Oklahoma Sooners, Ole Miss Rebels. There you have it, your thoughts. Do you care about the college football playoff rankings? The first batch of them anyway. I sort of do. I mean, it's it obviously doesn't mean anything right now. And every year, everything sorts itself out. But it's nice to know where the committee stands and sort of accumulates as they go. And Ohio State, with the schedule that they've gotten through thus far, has been very impressive. Even if the specific magnitude of results on the Ohio State offense isn't where it's been under C.J. Stroud, Dwayne Haskins, uh, and uh, Justin Fields, a number of crazy quarterbacks. But... Look, getting by Notre Dame on the road, getting by Wisconsin on the road, and it's, you know, a a different kind of Wisconsin, getting by Penn State at home, like their results seem to be more meaningful as an undefeated team than anybody else in the country through nine weeks. It's great by me. I have no qualms with, uh, you know, a Washington team being down these past couple weeks, but still maintaining an undefeated status being in there at number five. That just, it all makes sense to me. And everything's going to sort itself out. So it's it's nice to see. And you you like the insight a little bit to see like, oh, well, they've, they're have they undefeated, but they've struggled here. Or they have one loss, but they've looked strong there. I, I appreciate that. Didn't watch the show, but I like perusing the rankings as they're released. Beautiful. Well, um, I <laughs> Do have Do you have any thoughts? No, yes? No, I call them the CMCFP, the Completely CM. Meaningless College Football Playoff Rankings. Okay. I just came up with that acronym. I hope you like it. It's a lot of letters, but it's good. College football playoff rankings week one slash week 10, whatever. Do you think those out. four teams are the best four teams in the country right now? Um, I don't think Ohio State's one of the four best teams. You don't think Ohio right State's one of the four best? No. No. So who would you put in place of Ohio State in that top four? Uh, I understand why they're number one. I said on the last show, I believe they're probably wow, be number they're one. one, but they're not even top four. Okay. No, I, I think Oregon's better. I put Oregon Oregon's in over, Ohio, State. over Ohio State, and uh, I know Washington beat them heads up. I think we're going to get a rematch of that. I, I would. I think Oregon's a better team. Okay. That's just me personally. All right. Okay. Your words, not mine. Solid Verbal College Football Podcast is what you're listening to right now. 
make sure you give us a subscribe or follow wherever it is you get your pods. Uh, give us a holler at 855-VERBAL-3 as you're watching the games all throughout College Football Week 10. Uh, we play those on our College Football Week 10 recap show, which, of course, you can find uh, late on Saturday nights live on YouTube. Also, um, on your podcast feed, like bright and early Sunday morning, we call it a campfire. We gather around, we express our emotions, and we play your voice messages again at the reverb line at 855-VERBAL-3. Last what, time, what time once again? Saturday night? Uh, midnight. That's right. Well, Saturday That's night right. tie. Maybe one one eye on, is it UCLA, Arizona late? And one eye on Saturday night tie, the college football campfire, the reaction campfire. And Boise Fresno, hello. That's true. Absolutely. Mountain West mayhem. Um, last but certainly not least, over at verballers.com. That's where you can get ad free episodes and full Monday episodes and access to our Discord. Uh, we've got a big, and I mean big, game going on right now in week 10. Call it run the board. Yeah. All you got to do is sign up to play. Uh, Dan, you get to pick this week what our $100 gift card is for. Right. You, I mean, I gave it to you and you said Adam and Eve. I don't even know if that <laughs> exists as a company anymore. Not, not a sponsor. I don't even know. I had to look be. up what that was. Ty, you've just been pounding that. Um, so, uh, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. We'll come back to it at the end. We'll announce it at the end. I got to think on it a little bit, Ty. Um, should we get into our, our preview? I would love to. Dan, Ty, help. I need picks of the week. We've got a fun week of games. I thought a great way to frame out the week would be with a good weather report, if you're okay with that. I'm okay with let's it. Just get, let's just ease right into this thing. It's our friend Tim Buckley. Dan and Ty, November is here. You know what that means? Well, it's supposed to mean bad weather, but we don't know where the bad weather is. It is mm. nice all across the country. The South is looking good. Bama, LSU, Georgia, Missouri. Gamecocks picking on Gamecocks. Sunny in 72 in Columbia. Great weather for Bedlam. The Big 12 looks fine. We have good stuff even for Northwestern and Iowa at Wrigley Field. Sunny and 60 there. We do have a region of concern. It is the Pacific Northwest. Who would have thunk it? Some showers. Oregon, Wazoo, those places. A little damp, but that's it. Pretty nice. Enjoy the games. Mm, I like Pacific that. Pacific Northwest. We'll get that's back true. to that when we talk about all the games in the Pacific Northwest. But let's start. Big dog number one. Can I just, can I write real quick, Ty? Just because I think there's a, a pretty specific theme in mind in my brain for oh. this Saturday, Ty. Oh, please. I'm looking across the sport. I just want to make sure this is in the back of everybody's minds because I look across the sport and I see a number of half teams. I see a number of half seasons, right? You look at LSU, offense, defense. You look at Oklahoma State, the first part of their year, the second part of the year. Things can go differently. So maybe some teams start fast. Some teams, you know, wind down in November, whatever it is. And I thought to myself, what's half and half? I'm thinking bifurcation, tie. And then I thought, you know, what I'm about to say has been banned in 14 countries this type of Saturday. Nation states, sovereign regions. Whoa. But I'm going to say it anyway, Ty. Welcome to the return of Centaur Saturday. Oh, we got it. Half and half. Half man, half horse. Welcome back to Centaur Saturday. That horrible sound. Oh, my God. That sound haunted our dreams like three yeah. years ago. Welcome All back. Right. Big dog number one. Big dog number one. 12 p.m. high noon Eastern time on Fox. It is Kansas State at Texas. Texas is favored by four and one half points. Dan, uh, this, this is the Big 12 blender game, man. That's what this is. This is a Big 12 blender game because this game right here could ruin the Big 12's playoff chances. Totally ruin it if K-State wins. It's over. Done. Done. You think so? I mean, I, Oklahoma doesn't have a shot still? Oklahoma's got a shot, but Oklahoma's probably going to lose again. Okay. That's my prediction. So I think K-State winning this game at Texas, that'd be a problem. That'd be an obvious problem. So what say you, looking over this matchup, keep in mind Kansas State's won the last two games over TCU and Houston by a combined 82-3 to score. So they're playing pretty well. They lost this game last year by seven, the year before by five. In fact, six of the last seven matchups here have been one-score games. I look at the matchup here. I don't want to supersede anything you have to say. 
Uh, again, it looks like a one-score game. To me, that's why the point spread is within one score. So what say you? Yeah, I think last year was an Adrian Martinez, uh, Kansas State, Texas affair. So not totally fair to look at last year's results, but it, it still is what it is. Um, I like K-State here, and I'm going to tell you why, Ty. Tell me why. If we're to agree that K-State, at the very least, is pretty good, because the results have been somewhat inconsistent, the way they lost to Mizzou, the way they lost to Oklahoma State, and going on the road to take on a good team on the road, I'm not going to say uh, Daryl K. Royal is a, an electric, difficult place to play. I don't think it has that reputation. It's tough, but it's not the craziest. K-State is pretty good, at its very least. They're situationally very strong. The offensive line has improved over the course of this season. They've run the ball well. Uh, Will Howard has been a little bit sloppy, but they've been good in the red zone with Avery Johnson. Like, there's there's a lot to still like about this K-State team as a pretty good team. I don't love where Texas is at right now with Malik Murphy. I look at last week's results, and it's his first full game starting, and so it's going to take some time to get into a rhythm. It didn't seem like Sark trusted Malik Murphy. You saw the red zone stuff going to the Wildcat. It was sort of hit this receiver, and if not, don't start scanning. Just kind of take off. I look. You look at the short fields. You look at the the Xavier Worthy punt return touchdown. I think the score was not necessarily indicative of where the offense was last week. They ran well, but I don't think it's a complete offense with Malik Murphy. Whereas I think K State is better formed. And again, once again, very good situationally. Third down, red zone stuff. K State has been largely nails. So I'm going with Kansas State to win this game. I think Texas is a flawed team without Quinn Ewers, and they are not able to fully do what they do with Malik Murphy. The trust isn't there, so I'm going K-State plus the points on the road. Yeah, and I really like Malik Murphy. I think I think he's got a lot of potential. I went back, I, I rewatched the game, as I know you did, against BYU. I think he's got potential to be really good. He's certainly going to be a top transfer target. I, would, I You know, I take that right. one to the bank. But, yeah, not not comfortable laying the points here. I, I'm with you. I think he got better as that game went on against BYU, got a little bit more confidence. But it's pretty clear, as you said, that they tried to keep the game plan vanilla with him. Most of his success came on those routes where it was one read and if not, go. And that is not the sign of, I think, a play-calling scheme, a coach, a, an offense that is comfortable with its, with its new quarterback. Um, the other thing that I noticed is when he saw pressure, he tended to float a ball in some direction and not necessarily take the sack. And that's fine. You can get away with it against BYU. I don't think you can get away with it against Kansas State because K-State's, K-State's going to bring more pressure. They're just better at bringing pressure. And I think they're better at punishing teams that um, you know ha- have a quarterback that isn't at full confidence or th- doesn't have the full arsenal of the playbook at his disposal. So, you know, K-State's going to give up a big pop or two on the ground. That's kind of been their M.O. this season, albeit a solid rushing defense. They do give up some of those longer rushing plays. Yeah. They're just significantly better at getting pressure, and that's the thing that I came back to here. So I think if K-State can contain Texas on the ground and keep it close, um, they win this game outright. I'm, I'm just not confident Texas can lean on Malik Murphy to win this game. I think it's low scoring. I don't know if you yeah. agree with that, but like 24 21 K State. I have 23 well. 20 K State. Yeah. Yeah. So we agree. We agree. Next big dog. <laughs> Next big dog, Dan, is uh, they call it Bedlam. You may be familiar with yes. Bedlam. It is 3 30 Eastern on ABC. It's Oklahoma minus six on the road in Stillwater, Oklahoma against the Oklahoma State Cowboys, Dan. One of the great college football rivalries we have in this beautiful sport. Um, do we want to throw the records out for this one? You always have to throw the records out. Bad one, yeah. out. So look, you know, I've been watching Oklahoma state like a hawk these last couple weeks. Mm-hmm. And you know how I feel about their in season turnaround after the back-to-back losses earlier in the year, they go into a bye, they come back, they beat Kansas state, they beat Kansas. They've got the same record. And at least in the AP poll, weren't ranked ahead of Kansas or Kansas State. So a little disrespect with a capital D there. Ranked in the playoff rankings. Ranked in the playoff, but the AP, yep. you know, the, the guys that write about this stuff and gals that write about this stuff were not giving them the respect they deserve. Drop so 50 on West Virginia on the road. Yep, yep. Also, if you believe in Oklahoma State, you could still get Ollie Gordon at 60 to 1 to win the Heisman right now. He's at about 1,100 yards on the season already. Yeah. yeah. You could still get, if they win this game, if they mount any kind of Big 12 charge, 
Ollie Gordon's interesting at 60 to one right now to win the Heisman. If you're, if you're into that sort of thing, certainly worth a a $5 flyer, right? My thing is this. Oklahoma's better. (laughs) Oklahoma, Oklahoma's better. They're just, they're the better team here. Agree. Their, Their offense is better. Their defense is better. They've got the better quarterback. They've got better skill talent. And they've got more ways to win a game like this. That's sort of your underthink express yeah. of the week. If you really want to dive in, you could say Oklahoma State's not going to get enough pressure. Dylan Gabriel's going to pick them apart. But um, I feel deep into my marrow that Oklahoma is better in nearly every facet of this game. And they always win this game. Almost always. Almost always. Yeah. Almost always. And I like what Oklahoma State's done. You know, I was I was one of the big anti-Oklahoma State guys mm-hmm. to start the season. I, this goes all the way back to last year. I've just not been a fan of the way they're building this team. Look, I'll eat the crow. Credit where it's due. Mike Gundy's done a good job. They found a way to bolt this thing back together after a rocky start. After the bye week, they've looked really impressive. Yep. My problem is that their offense is all Ollie Gordon. It's all Ollie Gordon. Alan Bowman is not going out there and slinging it like he did as a freshman at Texas Tech way back when in 1997. This is just a different a different look for this Oklahoma State team that is very, very dependent on the ground, and I don't know if you can expect a whole lot through the air other than to just balance out the offense. So I think Ollie Gordon's going to eat. I think he'll okay. be fine against this Oklahoma defense. It, it's certainly not a shutdown sooner defense. I just think that there are offense is too one-dimensional and i think that their defense does not have the answers for what oklahoma is going to throw at them so i like oklahoma comfortably here i'd say 38 24 i'd also say lock of the week lock of the week wow a road favorite in a rivalry game lock of the week you said it yourself though you said it yourself oklahoma just wins this game they they they, exclusively win this game and if they don't, they lose their head coach to USC, as I <laughs> joked about on Andy Staples' show. Um, so, right. this is a very interesting two two events coming together at the same time, where Oklahoma State is on the up, Oklahoma's a little bit on the down, both barely winning and then losing to Kansas. Oklahoma fans most certainly down on the program right now. The way that they lost to Kansas, certainly not ideal. Uh, Jeff Levy getting a lot of heat. The defense not looking as deep as it needs to be to be a playoff team over the course of 12, 13, 14 weeks. Uh, I think it would be very easy. And I I found myself getting seduced by the Styron song of Stillwater. Whoa, that's a lot of S's. That's alliteration. It's baby. alliteration. Yeah. Um, Oklahoma is better. Oklahoma is better. I'm still going to take the points. I think they edge out Oklahoma State barely. I think they barely win this game. Maybe like the way that they won the Texas game. Maybe like the way they won that UCF matchup. I trust Dylan Gabriel more. If I'm going to if I'm going to believe it's close, I trust Dylan Gabriel leading this team down the field with 4 minutes left more than I trust Alan Bowman, British comedy legend Alan Bowman. So, I am going Oklahoma State to cover at home as a home dog, but not to win outright. I have OU winning this game. Next big dog. <laughs> 7.30 ABC, Washington minus three and a half at USC. Yeah, another road favorite. These teams have not played since 2019. It's crazy. It's wild. Yeah. I didn't believe it when I saw it. I, I checked a couple sources, but they haven't played in four years. And obviously a lot's changed since then. In terms of the standings, just in terms of the standings, the raw standings, these are the top two teams in the Pac-12. Because USC's five and one in the conference, Oregon's four and one, so they've got a game on them there, and Washington obviously five and zero. Oh. The narrative on USC is interesting because it is centered mostly around the Trojan defense, around Lincoln Riley maybe going to the NFL, or I don't know, just in general kind of being a weenie about the media. Wow, yeah, well, it's true. He has. No, it's good use of weenie. Continue. Thank you. But this is still a seven and two team. They've got a great offense. They can cause problems. They can still win the conference on the flip side two and seven against the spread which is 129th in the country they're only better in that respect than temple illinois and vandy so let me start here this isn't a betting show per se the certainly over- not when you're talking certainly not when I'm talking. <laughs> yeah. very true thank you dan yeah the over under at time of recording is 76 and a half if you are betting over under which one are you picking so 76 and a half 76 and a half 
uh, with a three and a half point Washington line. So it's like a 40 to 37 ish type right. prediction from our friends in the desert. Uh, I would take the over in this one. Yeah. I think I, I think I like taking the exciting points here in what should be with Washington being outgained these past three weeks, I believe, and losing the turnover battle with USC looking very complete on offense and fully not present on defense. <laughs> Here's here's the interesting thing to me. Cause so I'm taking USC to win this game outright at home. And I'll cool. tell you why. Okay. I'm taking USC because I think it's the, a nice confluence of Washington coming in as the favorite and looking pretty, not bulletproof because of the way that they've played, but explosive on offense and coming away with wins. Winning is a skill in Washington. Even when they're down, they win. And that's a, that's a big deal. And USC has been sort of a joke because of the high-profile nature of Lincoln Riley and the high-profile nature of giving up what they've given up to Notre Dame, to Utah, to Cal last week, right? The, the defense is leaky. I'm taking USC because Washington very specifically plays a brand of offense where they have these great receivers and they're sending them deep that I think USC is not going to handle, but I think they can handle it better than the team that is going to go straight at them on the ground like Utah, like Notre Dame. USC is not built to stop, to, to stop that type of offense, and I think Washington offensively is a little bit too stubborn to say, what if we just ran the ball 40 times straight at USC? I, I just That offense, that pseudo-air raid type system that Ryan Grubb and Washington run with Michael Penix, I think with Michael Penix looking a little bit sloppier through the air, throwing interceptions, we saw that big one against Stanford in the closing moments that gave Stanford a chance, the one he threw in the end zone. It was an incredible play. I think USC can handle that better. So I think we're getting a matchup of a little bit of underrated, overrated, that I'm going to buy low on USC right now. And I think Caleb Williams performs on this stage against this type of opponent. I think the crowd will be into it. I'm taking USC to win this one by four, 48-44. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa, Dan, that would be a big one. Yeah. That would be a big one. I look, I would go over. in an I'm still Caleb F and Williams moment. Yeah, I like that. I like that narrative that you set up and I'm on the over as well. Um, my general rule, and I'm not going to play the sound. We've already played enough sounds in this episode. Yeah. My general rule is if you think a game's a shootout, err on the side of the points. Sure. Because for as much as a shootout is about offense and big offensive numbers, these pinball stats that we talk about on the recap show. It's much more about not being able to trust either defense to hold a lead. And that's sort of where I'm at with this game. Yeah. USC is absolutely good enough to score with Washington. And to be honest, the fact that this line is not higher is a pretty good indication to me that I should be taking USC as well. So I'm okay. still with you. I don't know if USC wins outright, but I want those points. You want, want those? The points. By the way, big moment potentially for Marshawn Lloyd in USC on the ground to control clock a little against a Washington defense that has struggled somewhat against the run. 45, 44, Washington wins. 45, 44. They're able to keep pulling out close ones on yep. the road. Okay. Yep. Yep. Give me Washington we to disagree. win, but well, we disagree on the, on the, on the winner. Yeah. But not on the point spread. Let's go to the final big dog here. <laughs> 745, just to be a little bit different with the start time. Yes, sir. Got to be a little bit different in the SEC where it just means more. CBS, LSU at Alabama. Bama favored by three points. Uh, let's just acknowledge something off the bat. This one's kind of impossible to predict, yeah? I mean, if you're you. if Oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> why, why, is it, why do you see it as being impossible? Because of Alabama offensive inconsistencies and LSU's absence of defense against quality teams? Every model, every number I looked up had this one as a virtual dead heat. And so from, okay. that, from that standpoint, I, I think it makes it hard. I would say the fact that this game is going on at the same time as Washington-USC makes for an incredible night of football. We're going yeah. to do the live stream at midnight, and we're going to be jazzed up from not, not just these games, but some of the others going on at night as well. It's a great day of college football. It's a great evening of college football. Um, I think this is the headlining matchup for college football week 10, frankly. Okay. Because you've got the LSU offense against the Bama defense, which is the two relative strengths of either team. You've got Jaden Daniels, who 
might be the best player in college football going up against a Bama defense. That in and of itself is worth Great. the price of admission. Very much looking forward to that. My theory, though, is that this is going to be won and lost on the other side of the ball. It's not going to be the strength on strength thing that everybody's focused in on. My theory is that it's Jalen Milrow against the LSU secondary in this game, and that's what the, what, what decides the, the ultimate outcome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's honestly more specifically to that. I think it's probably a struggling Alabama offensive line against LSU up front, which has been inconsistent but still has playmakers, and they're beat up now. Uh, I still like if, – if you're going to say you can give me an Alabama defense that has been performing on a high level – Giving only three and a half. I got three, man. It's three. Three, three and a half. Sorry, three points. If you're giving three points with Alabama's defense at home with Alabama improving, not necessarily scoring a ton in second halves, but nonetheless, with Alabama's offense still popping big plays against okay defenses, and LSU's defense is very much not okay, right? They're sort of in a My Chemical Romance situation. They're not okay. (laughs) I promise. I'm taking Alabama here. I'm not. This is me underthinking once again. I'm taking Alabama's defense at home in a night spot in, I mean, I, let's call it a, it's a rivalry. It's a huge game every year, no matter what the records are. And so I, I'm going Bama here. I think they can connect three to four times downfield. And I think they can stop, you know, an emerging what Logan Diggs has been very good on the ground to, to make this a, a nicely balanced LSU offense. I just, I'm not there. Even with LSU beating a better Bama team last year at LSU, I, I just don't think the Tiger defense is where it needs to be to win the game this year. So I'm okay. taking Bama here. So, so look, if you've watched or listened to our show, other shows, if you watch any of the games, you know LSU's defense has objectively been a mess. Yeah. That's not new territory. Not new news we're breaking on this show. The big uh-oh moment, though, was at the end of the first half of the Army game two weeks ago because that's when Zy Alexander went down with an ankle. Who's Zy Alexander? Zy Alexander is a transfer who has been LSU's most reliable corner so far this season, and he's not going to play in this Bama game. That only makes matters way worse for Brian Kelly and the secondary for LSU. Brian Kelly knew coming into this season that the secondary was going to be a problem. That's why he went out and he brought in four transfers, including... Zai Alexander, he brought in J.K. Johnson, Denver Harris, Deuce Chestnut. All four of those guys are either inactive or injured, so none of them are playing. What that means for the LSU secondary is that their top two corners against Alabama this week are Sage Ryan, who's sort of like the Mike Gallego of the secondary. They just move him around. and Timely plug him reference time. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, they, they move him around. They plug him in wherever they need to. He's played safety. He's played nickel corner. Now he's going to be the number one corner. He's done okay as the primary guy, and I think he knows where he's supposed to be. But, okay, he's your number one. That means your number two is Ashton Stamps, a true freshman with one start who's also been nicked up. If one of those guys comes out for a breather or if Alabama goes five wide, the next guys up have virtually no experience. Jeremiah Hughes, true freshman, LaTerrence Welch, a sophomore who hasn't played much. I could go down the list, but you get the point. Right. You get my point. I think that's a huge problem in this game because Bama, favorite stat, averages 13 air yards a pass. Jalen Milrow, he's he's not doing the three-yard pop pass. Um, that's not what his uh, offense looks like. Right. It's either a handoff or F it, we're going deep. Yeah. That is, that is this offense right now with where it's at. So you can understand how that puts a lot of strain on the LSU defense, it puts them in a box. You can't overcommit to the run because you've got an inexperienced secondary that might be overmatched. You've also got the situation where you can't overcommit to a pass because Bama would just love to run it 50 times if you let them. And that's a, that's but they a haven't been running it crazy they well. Yeah, they haven't. But that's a dilemma. And if I can see it, Nick Saban can see it. Tommy Reese can see it. So I will say to your point, the Bama offense has been annoyingly inconsistent this season. It is by no means a juggernaut like we've seen in years past. I just don't think LSU has the answer for that problem in the secondary. I don't think they can solve that. In the end, Jaden Daniels is going to get his. He'll put on a cape. He'll keep him in it. But I think Bama wins. I think Bama covers. I think it's a high-scoring game. It's a lot of fun, 37-30. I agree. I I fully agree. They've played 
Look at look at the teams that they've played with pretty good defenses. Florida State, big loss. Arkansas, near loss. Ole Miss, loss. Uh, Mizzou, near loss, got that pick six at the end, still gave up 40. And so I just don't think you can trust a half team like this in Tuscaloosa, so I'm going Bama here. All right, we agree. Wow, it's a lot of big dog agreement. I hate it. You want to build some quads? Let's build some quads. Think about the heart, the passion, the love, the commitment, and the energy you're willing to put into it. You know who has a big quad? Big set of quads? Centaurs. Uh, They're horse quads, Ty. They are horse quads. They're very, very powerful. Yeah. Here is what this segment is. We take a look at each window of college football games. We pick out the four games that we would put in our dream quad box if you could watch four games at once. Trying to give you a sense for what you should watch and um, not what you shouldn't watch, but but where where we're training most of our attention because these games are exciting. It says a lot about week 10 in the college football world that Missouri, Georgia is not one of the big dogs, but it's not one of the big dogs. I'm sorry. It's okay. 330. It's on CBS. It is number 12 in the college football playoff rankings. Mizzou on the road at Georgia. Georgia's favored by 15 points. Dan, who you got Georgia? Cause I think it's another confluence matchup. I think it's another matchup of like, oh, Mizzou's been playing well this year. And I think there's hope from people that, you know, Mizzou might be that last matchup to give Georgia trouble. The problem is I think Georgia has its act together. The problem is when Georgia plays against teams that are ranked, specifically ranked, you look at what they've done against the spread since 2021, this latest wave of Georgia football. There's something like 10 and 3 against ranked teams against the spread since the start of the 2021 season. They always have their attention on these types of matchups and games. When Mizzou played them tough before, it was sort of an off-the-radar matchup on the road. Mizzou is what, number 12 in the current college football playoff rankings? The game's in Athens. I think there's a certain amount of confidence after what Georgia did to Florida that they're hitting their stride. Lad McConkey is healthy. We saw, I mean, there was, a, I think, a big catch from Oscar Delp, Brock Bowers is... Uh, replacement, but receivers are stepping up. We saw big plays from Dominic Lovett. Like they're forcing turnovers. I just, I think they're rounding into shape, which is scary. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of want from people taking the points, but not a lot of people who would actually wager big American dollars on Mizzou covering the spread with this year's version of the Mizzou defense. So I have Georgia winning by three touchdowns. Some in the way that they won against Florida last year, I think it's more want than realistic wagering if you're taking the points here. So I have Georgia winning this game, I don't know, 38-14, something like that. Yeah, that th- honestly, that is really good analysis. And I feel like you're my yes! psychologist. I feel like you're my psychologist. And here's why I say that. I really struggled with my internal dialogue on this football game. I want desperately for Mizzou to make this a game. And I looked at the numbers and I struggled with it. I am still going to pick Mizzou to make this a game. Because okay. Because I want to. Because I want It's the to. want, right? It's want. It is the want. It's 100% the want. So I agree completely. I was going to tell people, I, j- I jotted it down here on my note sheet, don't take my advice in this game. Just don't. <laughs> I'm biased. I'm biased. Right. I'm biased. So there is a lot of credence to what you talk about when you say Georgia in big games. I jotted down big game back. Yeah. Could because be. There have been two games this season where we kind of doubted what he could do. The Kentucky game and most recently the Florida game. And you know what he was in those games? He was nails. Mm-hmm. He was nails in those football games. Those are the only two college football games that Georgia has played this season where they covered the spread. They're 2-5-1 on the, on the year. Those only two games were the two biggest on the schedule, Kentucky and Florida. You know, like when you're playing a video game and you're wandering around a video game universe and you're collecting diff- you're collecting health or you're collecting new weapons, I kind of view like Carson Beck is in like a link spot, right? With every successive week, he's picking up new potions, new health, new swords, and that's only making him more powerful. I wish I had the Legend of Zelda sound at my ready, but I do not. <laughs> <laughs> we're already we're already sounded up. Heavy. My models got Georgia minus 18 and a half. Okay. But my theory in my heart is that Eli Drinkwitz has these guys fired up. 
that Mizzou is good enough on offense to move the ball in Georgia, which I, I do believe to an extent. Off a of bye week. Off a of bye week. I think Mizzou's really good. I don't think they're winning this game, but I, I believe they can score. And also, bear in mind, like, history in games like this or recent history, I think matters a little bit. This was an inexplicably close game in 2022. 26-22. I remember sitting yep. at my dinner table texting you, like, how the hell is this happening? Nobody understood that game, if you remember it. We were all texting each other. We were tweeting. Nobody knew. Why is this game close? It didn't make any sense. So I'm going to say Georgia wins the game 31-23. Do not take my advice here. Okay? <laughs> Do not bet at your own risk if you're going to side with me on this one. I'll put this one down in the verballer uh, run the board thing that we do. The pick em pool. I'm going to go with Mizzou plus the points. 15's a lot. Georgia, 31-23. I mean, if look, if, if a Bond villain were coming after you and you were shackled down and the laser was slowly making its way between your legs, would you rather give or get the points based on being correct and getting the laser turned off? I'd much rather give it. All right. The other games in this quad here. Actually, this is like a, I don't know, a, a Quinn, Quinn, Quint box, quint, quintuplet box. I added a fifth game. A pentabox? Pentabox, thank you. Yeah. State school here. Uh, I've got 330 Penn State at Maryland. Penn State favored by 10. I've also got Virginia Tech at Louisville. Whoa. Louisville favored at home by nine and a half points. I've got Iowa minus five on the road at Northwestern. And I've got um, James Madison. James this Madison game. at Georgia State. Yeah, it's a big game. James yeah. Madison... Minus five and a half, the Maddies on the road here. Still undefeated on the road at Georgia State. So g give me a little something about those games. Where's your head at? I like Penn State against Maryland. Maryland seems to be collapsing, and I think the mismatch of Penn State's front on defense against Maryland's offensive line is going to eventually overwhelm things like what Penn State was able to do against Northwestern, even if it's somewhat close and Penn State's offense still is kind of a mess. I like Virginia Tech on the road. I don't know if I can go fully outright. But Virginia Tech, by the way, 3-1 and one in the ACC. They could be in the ACC championship game. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, Ty. College football week 10. <laughs> the defense gets after the passer, as we saw against Syracuse. Kyron Drones has been very good. I think it's Daquan Felton who emerged in that game against Syracuse. I don't think Virginia Tech is great, Ty, but I think they're pretty good, and I think they can cover the spread. Maybe Louisville overlooks them a little bit. It's a big number. I think Louisville's good. But it's a big number, and I believe in a reasonable right to Brent privacy. No. Is that – can I? No? No? Okay. God, I apologize. I'm terrible. I well, should look, be – Yeah. Look, I like Louisville. Yeah. I don't think they're 11 and 1 good. Okay. I think they're good. I think there's going to be a random blip, and I agree. We agree way too much this week. This strikes me as a 23-17 style game. Yeah, because Virginia Tech's involved, they're not going to score a lot of points. I know they've put up thirty-eight on Syracuse. They're getting better. They're running. They are. They are getting better. And Kyron Drones has been good on the ground. It's been I a just, different team. It really has. It really has. So I, I'm with you. I would take the points on this one. Um, I, I should point out. I'm not going to play any sounds, but Brian Ferentz officially out at the end of the season for Iowa. Yay. I saw our friend Bud Elliott point something out that if every offensive coordinator had the same. <laughs> Uh, assignment to hit 25 points a game, they'd all be gone. Yeah. All, every Big Ten West offensive coordinator. So Brian Ferentz just stacked up the season <laughs> seasons a little more often. That's all. Yeah. So I'm on Iowa minus the five against Northwestern. Uh, same. Um, and I'm on James Madison minus five and a half because of their defense against Georgia State. It's a big game in the group of five. And um, a lot of steam on James Madison. I saw the... I believe Attorney General of Virginia is looking into whether they can overturn the bull ban. Yeah, super important. Yeah, so, something like that. It is important, man. Yeah, uh, um, I have Georgia it. State. By the way, Do I you? have Georgia State. Yeah, James Madison on the road has been sneaking by teams, which is great. Winning is a skill. I respect it. I like it, but I don't see them as a twelve and zero team. So I am going with Georgia State at home as a home dog to pull the upset. Darren Granger and his guys getting it done. We saw James Madison almost lose to ODU last week, I believe. Mm. I'm going Georgia State here. By the way, I'm with you on Penn State. I got them 34-21. I, I could speak a lot to the um, unease I feel about this Penn State offense 
and especially going into a big spot like this for Maryland at home. But do you know what the series is all time, Penn State versus Maryland? All I know is no matter the state of the world, Penn State seems to just obliterate Maryland. <laughs> that was exactly what I jotted down. Yeah. Penn State, no matter what, almost no matter what, yeah. kicks the crap out of Maryland. The series all time, Penn State leads 42 three and one. <laughs> Do you think there's like Taylor Swift bad blood between James Franklin and the Terps where he makes an, uh, an extra special point to do more game planning and get more creative against Maryland? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. They Former. kill Maryland. They kill. The last time that Maryland won, this was 2020, and that was you know, a weird year for a variety of reasons, but Penn State's been pretty good. They won 30 to nil a year ago. So Give did me... you say you have, you have Iowa Northwestern in your, your quad? I do. I do have him in the quad. Just of the intrigue, the post Brian Ferentz. Well, he's he's still there, but the the post Brian Ferentz officially sort of begins uh, now. Right. Uh, I'd probably put, um, and I, I like your official solid verbal quad. Do you want me to go through the rest of these really quickly? Give, give me fifteen and twenty seconds on other teams that you'd consider swapping in for Iowa Northwestern. What has Utah done to give double digit points on offense against an, at least an okay team? I have ASU plus the points. Uh, at altitude, I have Florida State minus whatever against Pitt. I have Georgia Tech against Virginia. Virginia has done nothing this year except lose close games to quality teams. They did beat I'm, North Carolina. I'm in on Virginia there, by the way. I like Virginia. If you believe in the snip snap, Georgia Tech loses this week. I don't believe it. CW, so I'm I'm going to take those points. Um, I have Minnesota against Illinois, even though it's November. It's Minnesota came alive a little bit on offense last week, so I'm going uh, Sky Uma. Houston against Baylor. Houston plays offense most of the time Baylor does nothing all of the time so right. I'm going Houston there uh betting against Cincinnati has been a very profitable endeavor and so I'm just gonna say keep doing it and take UCF give those points on the road uh I'm gonna give the points as well Auburn at Vandy Vandy just has not been good in terms of scoring consistently and I'm gonna give the points Air Force against Army Army's been very bad and I think Air Force can cover big numbers because of their really very I would say a defense that's been pretty incredible for a long time now so i'm going falcons there uh on their on their search for the commander's cup let's uh let's travel back in time dan let's go to the early window welcome to the pain zones where we live that is where i live i'm no, still a quad pain. my early quad is notre dame at clemson it is texas a&m at old miss it is ohio state at rutgers and it is jacksonville state at south carolina Interesting. Okay. Um, let's start with Notre Dame, though. Please. Notre Dame, 12 o'clock ABC, favored by three on the road at Clemson. We got to start really where the world is starting in the college football world here. Dabo Sweeney with a fiery exchange this past week. Did you <sighs> what hear, were your did thoughts he, on that? Tyler from Spartanburg calling him out, saying you're getting paid all this money. What Go for? for, for. Yeah. What for? Um, I was Tyler. I don't know if that's public knowledge i was yeah i was you it was it was me yeah i've been to spartanburg spartanburg's fine um i totally understood where Dabo was coming from that you have to sort of debase yourself by going on this show and being abused by disappointed fans even if those fans are correct in saying how are you earning the money this year why are we not continuing to be at least pretty good as clemson has not been pretty good this year why have we fallen off so dramatically and Dabo has to sit there and take it? And I understand his, like he could have just done the coach speak thing where he says, you know what? I'm as disappointed or I'm more disappointed than anyone. We're going to get this thing right. Like he could have done that, but I'm always going to say whether right or wrong that it felt authentic. So I am going to say in my lower moments, I just would have been Dabo. I, I, I cannot sit and admonish his emotional reaction and his frustration for saying, I started out as the lowest paid guy. I worked up my, my way up. I've always been successful. I've led this team to unprecedented highs. I would do that. And maybe that's the, the flawed public persona that I, I'm sure I would have if I were in his spot. But I'm not going to sit here and say, here's how you should have handled it. No, I would have handled it the exact same way because I'm dumb too. So I say, good on you, Dabo, but uh, let's win more games and be more entertaining because it has not been fun to watch this year. You ever try to call a show like that, by the way? I think I've, I have called into voluntarily 
because I've been on a number of sports radio shows, yeah. brag much. Um, I have called, I think I called in once when I was like 11 years old. And I think I was not even allowed on the air. It's, it's all but impossible to get on the air yeah. with the coach because there's so much interest in talking to the coach. Yeah. This had, this had to be an inside job. I'm a conspiracy theorist on this. Wow, this had, really? This had a, yeah, this call came from, came from inside the house. It had to, because those producers are so on edge when it comes to, we don't want to troll going on the air with of the Of course, coach. of course. You know, they want to give them softballs. They don't want this to happen. That's that's bad for the coach. That makes the coach mad. That makes the coach look bad. Yeah. So some, somebody let this call through. Or Tyler from Spartanburg was really good at spoofing them into thinking oh, he I wasn't going to. Oh, I think, gonna. yeah, I think what he did is he told the producers, hey, I want to ask a question about uh, Cade Klubnik's development. You know, something like very. But if that's the case, if that's the case, the producers cut him off. They cut, yeah, that's they cut the that call off. They let him talk forever. So I yeah. somebody somebody was in on this. My theory. I okay? liked it. I think it was good radio, and it was entertaining to me, and I related to it. This game is easy for me. Okay. It's easy. Notre Dame's a better team. They're yeah. flawed, but they're they're better. Um, I was going to ask you who on the Clemson offense are you afraid of right now? If Will Shipley's out, he's in concussion protocol. Mm-hmm. Are you like a big Jake Brining stool guy? Like who who moves the needle for you on the Clemson offense right no. now, buddy? Nobody. No, I think Notre Dame's better, and they should win this. This you can underthink this one. Notre Dame is better. Look, they they beat up on a, a disappointing Pitt team to say the least last week. Pitt team that beat Louisville though, mm. somehow, some way. <laughs> Um, <laughs> God, the ACC is magical. College football week ten. Yeah, college football week ten. Uh, I like Notre Dame here. I think they're gonna they travel well enough. I think Clemson is reeling. And what exactly has Clemson done this year? Even though the game's at home, look, Clemson lost to Drew Pine last year, <laughs> decisively. <laughs> it was more Audric Estime than Drew Pine. I understand. But Drew Pine was involved, but we've all watched a team that surrounds an underwhelming quarterback with a ton of talent lose. And they got it together last year. Different offensive coordinator. You've had your own issues with this year's offensive coordinator, Jared Parker. But I'm still going Notre Dame here because I, the, the Clemson offense is fundamentally broken this year. As talented as a lot of the pieces are on defense, they're you know winning is a skill once again, and Notre Dame has that skill. Clemson does not. We're going to do a live watch along out on YouTube. Yes. This game. So you can watch. You're making graphics that I don't approve of <laughs> to uh, watch the Notre Dame game with me and experience it with me, a big game with me. Yeah. Heaven help you. But come on out, solve The ups and downs of yeah, watching a Notre Dame game with Ty. I'm much more emotional than you. I don't portray it here on the show. I'm sort yeah. of like the balanced host or something. No. When, when I'm watching Notre Dame, all bets are off. So you get to experience that with us. Yeah, it's easy to not be emotional when you're demolishing Utah from the onset. It's easy to just true. be pleasant. Also true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 28-14, Notre Dame wins. I have a fantasy thing for this game, by the way. Oh, what is it? So the commentators are Sean McDonough and Greg McElroy. Great. I love McDonough. Mm-hmm. I, I think he's the most underrated. Him, yeah. He's the most underrated announcer in the game. The most underrated bit from the most underrated announcer is anytime Sean McDonough expresses quiet dissatisfaction with something in the game. Okay. Okay. He's very t- polite about it. He's very polite about it. You know, he's kind of got this dry, monotone cadence to him. He's very good. I'm not, that's not a slant at all Legend. On, yeah. on Sean McDonough. He's great at what he does. But, at the end of September, the last time I think he called the Clemson game, it was Clemson's clock management. I thought he was going to short circuit, honestly. He was questionable decision yeah, there, it Gray. Was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounded something exactly like that. Yeah. He was talking about Dabo's clock management. So listen for that. The other thing that he does, and you almost don't notice it again because of his his just manner, he's going to drop a completely random pop culture reference. And it's going to be past you. You're almost not going to notice right. it. He did it at the end of the first half or first quarter, also in the Clemson-Florida State game, where he just casually dropped a Ric Flair reference and just kept moving. Okay, so, here's here's my question to you. Yeah. Do you think, and this isn't exactly a secret verbal, but if I, I know people at TV networks listen to this show. I know people you know that are on broadcast, broadcast crews listen to this show. 
Do you think we can manifest? Do you think we can will Sean McDonough into making a Dua Lipa reference in this broadcast? Dua Lipa. Yeah. If you're saying pop culture, do you think we can put that into the ether and that he can seamlessly weave the word Dua and then Lipa into this broadcast? So this is kind of like a secret verbal meets fantasy thing. Totally, yeah. This is I mean, us trying can, to wield our influential swords. If he, can, if anybody can do it, he can do it. Dua Lipa. You like Dua Lipa? I think she's great. Uh, I like the levitating song. That's one of my favorite songs. She's got, she's got a bunch of bangers. Okay. On the radio right now. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, we'll have to listen for that. I hope so. Um, the other games here, Texas at Ole Miss. Ole Miss favored by three. Ohio State minus 19 on the road at Rutgers. And I've got uh, the cockfight. Uh oh. South Carolina Gamecocks, Jacksonville State Gamecocks, South Carolina favored by 15 and a half points. What what do you got in these games? Uh I'm gonna take the points with Rutgers. Um I think they can keep this low scoring, especially in a bit of a letdown moment, physical game against Wisconsin for Ohio State, a little sloppy through the air. So I think Rutgers can even though it didn't happen against Michigan over the course of four quarters, I think Rutgers is enough of a half team on this centaur Saturday yeah. that <sighs> You got to warn me, man. I'm going to take those points there for Rutgers. Uh, what did you say? A&M Ole Miss? A&M Ole Miss, by the way. Can I can I throw something new out there? Yeah. If I could. Lock of the week. This isn't my lock. This is not this is not my lock. Right. I asked Jake, who helps us with social media to give us his lock of the week mm-hmm. because in the side pool that we run for like the secret verbal community yeah he's basically already won like he's he's <laughs> lapping the field it's yeah. been an incredible heater for jake i'm calling this the jake locker of the week wow the nostra jakus he's got old miss minus three agree, i like disagree you know, what do you think okay so i i love old miss here texas a&m i the stat my favorite stat of the the mid-season this year is that uh the aggies haven't scored a second half offensive touchdown in now like 38 days um <laughs> We're all into what we're into, Ty. College we all have our preferences. Week 10. College football week 10. Yeah. We all have our preferences. We all have the stuff that sort of tickles us behind the ear. And without question, Lane Kiffin's very personal, very public kink is making fun of and beating Jimbo Fisher in Texas A&M. <laughs> there is nothing <laughs> Lane Kiffin enjoys more than needling Jimbo. He said something recently like, man, Figured they'd be top 10 with that the recruiting that they've been doing. <laughs> and he's just going to take every opportunity. So Ole Miss at home with, I think, uh, an overperforming defense. Uh, Jackson Dart being all-purpose. Quinshawn Judkins. I just I like Ole Miss here. Even though it's going to be still a tall task to score on this A&M defense, I just Max Johnson on the road against an Ole Miss pass rush that has been good this year. I'm, I'm going Ole but Miss why, here. Why I'm playing into the kink. Why is the line so low? Why is the line low? Ole you know? Miss slows down far too often to See, be. See, I'm I'm taking a And M. Okay, I'm taking because there's a mismatch in the trenches here, and it's the Al- the uh, Alabama, the A and M defensive line, the Ole Miss offensive line. I am not crazy about Ole Miss in big games, even That's though they spike they spike the football on me back in Week Five when I picked LSU to beat them. But I I think Ole Miss wins, but I think it's a defensive slugfest. I think it's ugly. I think it's low scoring with a lot of field goals and somebody wins 17-16. So I want the points. Never underestimate what makes Lane Kiffin tingle. That's all. That's all <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, I've got Ohio State minus the number. I I did the Rutgers deep dive. I think they've got a solid defense. They tackle well. They don't give up big plays. They force turnovers. On offense, they run it pretty well. But uh, Ohio State's better. 31-10, they win and cover. And um, I am taking Jacksonville State plus the points. Really? Yeah, I am. I am cuz they run the ball. They they run the ball. They're 7 and 2. They've got the 127th toughest schedule so far, but 6 and 2 and 1 against the spread. I think that this is the ultimate battle of the inefficient offense against the cataclysmic defense. So, I'm going to go plus the points here. I think Jacksonville State will be motivated. I'm very curious as to what South Carolina has in the tank at this point cuz they've I'm- just been I'm almost crushed. positive. Didn't Rich Rod interview for the South Carolina job way I, back when, when he was I at Arizona? He was, he was one of the first guys to interview for that yeah. job when it came open. Yeah. 
and I want to say Tom Herman may have been in conversation back then. Well, they wanted Tom Herman. Yeah, they wanted was, Tom Herman. Everybody was firing their coach to get Tom Herman, and they ended up with Will Muschamp, so it didn't work out. There was some story. I I could be fully making this up. There was some story that like we're interested in you, Coach Herman. Here is a coach ticket to South Carolina on a plane. He was like, No, no, <laughs> you're sending right. me coach. Let me. That's let not me a stop, good omen. Let me stop you right there. Yeah. Okay. Next. Um. And any other games that you would sub in to this quad for the next twenty seconds in that early window? Yeah. I'm a little bit interested in Nebraska, who's quietly been winning a bunch and should make a bowl game. Uh. Betting against Michigan State has been quite profitable this year. They don't have an offense, but it's it's a nice under the radar story that Nebraska has its act together on defense early. So that would be the only one I might throw in there. Arkansas, Florida is interesting, but I think Florida is just full on better because of the disaster that is Arkansas up front on offense. So those are the only ones under consideration. I'm giving the points with Florida, by the way. So, but no, I think your quad box is very sound. Night quads. You have to achieve failure. You have to take it that far. Nobody wants to go that far. It's too scary. But you know something? I got news for you. That's where winning is. That's where the quad father says that's where winning is. As we all agree. Quad father says the nightcap is where the winning is. I've got Kansas, Iowa State. I've got Miami, NC State, Kentucky, Mississippi State, and Cal, Oregon. In my quad, I don't feel good about it. I want to talk more about SMU at Rice and Georgia Southern Texas State because those are two big G5 games this week. There are a bunch of other games that we could have put in this quad. But um, regarding those first four that I mentioned specifically, where are you at? So Kansas-Iowa State is where I have this week's fantasy thing. Oh. I can't remember if I have used this as a fantasy thing in the past, and if so, I'm just repeating it. But I have a horned up RG3. <laughs> Anytime there's like some activity going on on the bottom of a pile on a fourth and short, I have a horned this up is RG3. So good. This is so He's good. always right there. He, you know, somebody, you know, I think his, his broadcast partner for this is Mike Monaco. Mike Monaco says something about tight ends or something. Yeah. Or, you know, there's a, sh- a crowd <laughs> shot of a, of a young gentleman with his arm around a lady. And RG3 never can help himself. And so I mostly enjoy it. So I'm going to horned up RG3 as a fantasy thing in Kansas at Iowa State. Uh, the clones <laughs> in Ames That's at so night. Great. Thank you. The clones in Ames at night. Defense, letdown spot for Kansas, giving two and a half. I like Iowa State here. 96% of the money is on Iowa State. You like that? Does that make you feel good? Sure. Um, I like NC State against Miami as a home dog. Okay. What has Miami done? What has okay. Miami done to earn this? That's and I don't think games. NC State is great, and they made the quarterback change. What has Miami done? Two two games in this quad so far that I disagree with you on. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Uh, I like Oregon giving the points, though. The the sloppiness in weather, I guess, has me a little bit concerned, and Oregon's obviously not going to try to pour anything on Cal if they're up big, but I think they're too complete. Cal down to its – look, they ran really, really well against USC, but I just don't think Cal is going to be able to, to move the ball for four quarters. So is I have Oregon – yeah. Is there a sandwich bet opportunity here for uh, to, to go on Cal because Oregon coming off of the Utah win and That's USC true. on deck? Yeah, no, it's it's a letdown look ahead sandwich for sure. And Oregon Cal has been traditionally closer than Oregon fans have loved. Uh, but I still I think Oregon's too complete that you know they're playing with so much attention to detail that I'm going Oregon to win by four touchdowns here, forty one thirteen. Okay, and um, Kentucky Mississippi State, who you got? I have Kentucky. I, I think the number is too low. Mississippi State has been a nightmare on offense, not in a good way. So I'm taking Kentucky on the road. Although the number feels suspiciously low to me, mm-hmm. which worries me. Mm, yeah, but I'm, I'm still I can't find that that reason. So I'm taking Kentucky. Yeah, I like Kentucky a lot in this spot. I really do. It's it's a tough stretch of defenses on the schedule for Mississippi State to round out this season. Kentucky, A&M on the road, and then Ole Miss at home for the Egg Bowl. I, I like Kentucky a lot here. I'm not crazy about Mississippi State, so I agree with you there. I agree with you on Oregon, but I did go back and look. Oregon hasn't covered 24 against Cal in any of their last nine matchups. Yep. But this is a different Oregon team. I, they're just built differently, and they're better. They come off the big road win, but that game was over early. That was a flash fry. Yeah. That was a flash fry. Um, I disagree on the Miami bet. I think because I'm just very lukewarm on NC State. 
Oh, I think that's totally fair. Let, let me put it this way. Miami should cover this. Miami should cover four. That doesn't mean they will. Okay. So I'm going to go Miami. And I'm going to go Kansas plus the points here because I'm going to fade the public. Public, 96% of the money is on Iowa State. Also, Kansas is a running team first and foremost, and that's the clear weaker part of a very good Iowa State defense. So we we disagree on that front. Let me let me speak very quickly to the SMU Rice and Georgia Southern Texas State games. If I okay. Can. Two games, if you have like a side quad, if that's a thing for you. We've got future ACC power SMU, which just annihilated Tulsa 69 to 10. Yeah. SMU is one of the teams with the 4-0 record in the American alongside Tulsa or Tulane, excuse me, and UTSA. Their defense is actually quite good. It, their defense is not just quite good, Ty. Their defense, in terms of points per drive, and you exclude garbage time in there, they're the most improved defense in America. Now, yeah. they've played a lot of hot garbage recently <laughs> in they terms of the offense is faced. But it's a good result. It's it's a good result. Rice, by the way, played tight with Tulane. They only lost 30-28. to 28. That was a good yeah, game. Yeah, came back nicely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go SMU by 14. Same. The, the line is SMU minus 12 on the road at Rice, but I like SMU. And the other game here, it's it's 7 p.m. So on ESPN Plus, it's George Southern minus two at Texas State with a really high over under. So it should be Ooh. fireworks in this game. But this is a big deal in the Sun Belt because Texas State lost last week to Troy and they lost at the beginning of the month to Louisiana. So they can't win the conference. They're not going to get in the title game. But they've got four shots now at bowl eligibility. And I think this game looks like their best chance to get it. Okay. So I, I'm going to take Texas State outright. I love the story with a new coach and all the transfers. This game's at home. Uh, we're a pro Bobcat show. We've always been. That's just, that's just how we roll here. So give me Texas State plus the two to win outright at home. All right. Fair enough. You want any more uh, also under considerations real quick? Uh, sure. All right. So I have West Virginia covering against BYU. BYU on the road is no bueno. Uh, I have Michigan minus anything against Purdue. That's a big number, though, but, like, you can't find a reason with Purdue. It's, what, 32, 33 points? 32, 32, yeah. Uh, I have Stanford on the road in the Palouse. Stanford, since that USC game, against any team with a decent, even average defense, has covered, barely lost, or won. Okay? So, Oregon, good defense, got killed. Uh, Arizona, decent, lost by one. Colorado, no defense, won that game in huge comeback fashion. Lost big to UCLA, good defense. Washington, suspect defense or decent average defense, barely lost. All I'm saying is Stanford can be competitive if you have a clear flaw defensively. What has Wazoo done to earn this number? I, has Wazoo lost four straight? Yeah. I believe they have, so okay. I'm taking the points here for Stanford. Okay. Um, I'm not going to play another sound, but there is a trio of – Interesting matchups in the yeah. late night window, right? You don't need a quad. You can maybe throw something else on in the fourth quad, uh, the fourth the fourth window of your quad. The Boise Fresno game. I consulted with Reverb Master Chief Reverb Engineer Fresno Shea on this one. Um, we both agree that Fresno should be able to throw in Boise, which yeah. is why you why you pick them. Um, there's a little bit of concern from from him. Of course, noted Fresno fan Fresno Shea. Yeah, that uh, there might be a book on how you beat Fresno, and that is control the clock, give it to your ground game, don't give them a chance to get out there and throw it. Also, Mikey Keen, our boy, we often do the Keen cast late nights when we record the show. Yep, been a little bit of a gunslinger lately, maybe throwing in indiscriminately and not being as careful as he should be. Yeah. I have not seen the status status on Boise's Ashton Ginty. He left the game last week with an injury. So I, this is all a very long way of saying Boise at Fresno minus three. I'm going to take Fresno minus three. As am I. I'm eating at the Shea Shack. Give me Fresno. Um, UCLA at Arizona. I'm going to go Arizona again because why not? I'm going Arizona. If you bet on Arizona, then you are profitable this year. Vegas has not been able to figure out Arizona uh, and definitely has not been able to figure out UCLA. I'm going Cats here. And then there's also Oregon State at Colorado in that late block. Colorado makes everybody look extraordinarily strong on offense and extraordinarily strong on defense. I'm going with the Beavers at altitude 
to cover against a wounded reeling Colorado. How about that? That does it, man. We made it through all the quads. Thank you to uh, Thomas Plotz, the original quad father. The original. Don't do the workout. We're told USA Weightlifting tells us don't do the workout, but um, no, no, no. do watch our quads for the optimal college football viewing experience in week 10. Type, you can do me a favor and drop some big, stanky, slippery thumping. Drum and fife. Got three games in the Patriot League. 12 p.m. Eastern time. Holy Cross at 5-3 and three on the road at Lehigh. 2-6. and six. Dan, who you got? Who you got? Who you got? Uh, Holy Cross. Big, big. In your backyard, give me Holy Cross. I am sending scouts to this game. As you should. I am sending scouts. Uh, give me Lehigh. Let's go Lehigh. What the hell? 1230. Colgate on the road at Lafayette. Lafayette 7-1. and one. Um, I, I believe ranked. If not, they should be in the FCS ranks. We might have to go to a Lafayette playoff game this year, Dan. We'll just see how it goes. But oh, yeah, these are playing well. They're playing well. We got Lafayette huge. 73-3. 70, wow. Come on. Uh, I, I'll go Yetis, too. Next. Final game. Bucknell. 3-5 and five on the road at Fordham. Fordham 5-3. and three. You think you're going to the, the boogie down Bronx and beating Fordham? Absolutely not. Give me the Rams huge. Since I'm going opposite of what I normally go, I'm going to yeah. go uh, Nellies here. Hold the Interesting. Upset. Okay. Disagree. Should we finish things out with a spirited game of <laughs> Ty versus the world? I would love to. Ty versus the world. Ty versus the world. Presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Can we play I... a new game also called Where in the World is Connor Stallions? As <laughs> like would he be at Rutgers? Is is Connor Stallions going to be the Rutgers defensive coordinator this week and nobody know it? <laughs> I'm sorry, we can that, play, we can play that next week. On the sideline? That's some balls. We'll play that next week. Yeah. If you want to play Where it next week. in the world? Yeah. I can find a way to mix that up. Okay. We're going to do that. Tie versus the world. Tie versus the world. So I've got big dogs here. I, I feel very confident in my picks. You heard Oklahoma minus the six. That is one of my picks. Um, I also feel pretty confident in saying Alabama minus three. Okay. Alabama minus three. Um, I'm also going to go on Notre Dame minus three as my three picks for this week. Those are my three. And then we have another one that we didn't come up with a name for. We've workshopped a couple different names here. We didn't have a chance to um, come up with exactly what we want to name this thing. But I've got a four-way parlay of team totals. I've got Alabama over 29.5 points, combined with Oklahoma over 28.5 points, combined with Ohio State over 27.5 points, combined with, last but certainly not least, Michigan over 35.5 points. Uh, I did the math. It's like four, four and a half to one, so pretty good odds on that. You don't even need them to win. You just need them to score points. And I think all four of those cases gives you a pretty good shot at it. What is the name for this parlay? I don't, so that's all overs. It's all overs. Yeah. Thinking blue blood over. You were you were trying to go with some sort of 30 and flirty. 30 and flirty. Come on. All of them scoring 30 plus. In the case of Michigan, what's their number? 35 and a half. Yeah. 30 and flirty parlay. 30 and flirty parlay. Let's go with that. It's great. 30 and flirty parlay. Let's go with that. Dan Rubenstein, of course. Football's more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Sign up with the code SOLID. New customers bet just $5 to get 200 instantly in bonus bets only on DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the NFL with code SOLID. Dan, the crown is yours. There you go. Did well last week. Hit the Catterday Night Live parlay. We're gonna you hit did. This one too. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it this week. Uh, did we come up with a prize for our run the board game, which you can go out to verballers.com and, and learn more about, or go to playruntheboard.com. We've been giving out gift cards the last couple weeks. Um, hundred dollars. Where do we want to give it out to? I don't know. <laughs> what What have you purchased this week, Ty? I purchased nothing this week. Dan. You have purchased nothing bored. this week. Been very boring. No. All right. No. Let me see. Okay. This is this is a. I, I think I have a really good idea here, Ty. I'm gonna make sure on the air that they are. Yeah. 
It's going to be $100 to Oxford Pennant. Oh. $100, and this is the description, designer and manufacturer of vintage wool and cotton pennants inspired by American sports traditions. Beautiful, Dan. I love it. Yeah, that's it. Going out again to overballers.com for more info on how you can be part of the community. And, of course, make sure you hit subscribe and follow the podcast wherever you get your pods. Rate and review the show if you like what you heard. For that guy over there, my good friend, Dan Rubenstein. For myself, Ty Hildenbrandt. College football week 10. College football week 10. (laughs) College football week 10. Stay solid. Peace. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY at 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario, see dkng.co slash football for eligibility terms and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply.